Hi my name is Matt, welcome back to the shop and this is a continuation on the fluid dynamics series and today we are looking at restrictions so to quickly gloss over last video we looked at flow through a constant volume or say I should I say a constant width two dimensional pipe and we briefly um, went over the um, three dimensional concept of it but today we're going to look at restrictions and this is what people think they know a lot about um, when it comes to flowing heads and ports and stuff like that but it, again like I say it's very complicated and there's a lot more going on so the first thing we're going to look at is the different types of restrictions and what happens um, before during the restriction and afterwards so the first thing we're going to look at is going from a larger uh, volume to a smaller volume so let's just already imagine that we're in a pipe. So we're in a pipe, a metre long pipe, and we're just looking at a section here. And this is what this looks like when we you know, zoom in, so to speak. So we have a flow moving from a two bar pressure region to a one bar pressure region, so from a high to a, a, a normal atmospheric condition. And the flow is moving in this diagram from left to right, and obviously we have a reduction in cross-section, in cross-sectional area. And our flow, I should use another colour, our flow comes beaming in like this, you know. And one of the first things you can see that happens is that obviously this section continues to carry on. Now let's just say this has 10 metres per second, 10 metres per second, and 10 meters per second. That is the average speed of the flow through this pipe. So as you can see the first thing that happens is, is all these molecules that are here and here in this strip are going to whack into these walls. Now like I say we're going back to the simplistic version of this because if we went with the chaotic um, fluid dynamic analysis where you know everything doesn't just flow, it's bouncing around like crazy, we'd never get anywhere. So Generally what happens is, is that we're just going to use this simple arrow diagram just to show the, the general flow, the general idea. So obviously what's going to happen is, is all these molecules in this top and bottom region are going to slam into this wall just like a car going back. So what you get is you get a slight pressure increase at this section here because obviously there's a wall resisting it. And this air here does two things. It bounces back bounces back into the floor so you get basically a floor reversal and it bounces into here it hits these and you get basically a restriction this is restricting the floor it's not all linear it's not all nice it's not all an average mean direction you get a restriction and what you get is you get a higher pressure region here now with a higher pressure region here now what you've got is an even lower pressure region here. This is this is two bar, this is one bar at the other end. So here you've got two bar of air steaming into these walls and they all start piling up like cars, you know, one after the other piling up into each other if a wall was suddenly put in, put in front of cars on a motorway. So they all start bounding up and you get a higher pressure region here. Now what happens is, is we've got a higher pressure region here and now a lower pressure region here, and now a lower pressure region here. But, this is the highest, this is the second highest, and this is the lowest. And, this air coming this direction has momentum, it has force to it. So basically, this high pressure region has a choice. It can either go this way, or it can go that way. It is higher, and like I say, air flows um, from a high pressure region, so a lower one. So what happens is it starts to squirt down here you get a pressure rise here, slight pressure rise here, and then this is even higher than this, so it starts to force its way this way, and this is what increases the speed, because you've got a higher pressure than you would have normally, this is two bar going into one bar, so you have a certain speed, so we'll say 10 meters per second. If you increase this region, and it's a small region, to just say 2.5 bar, we can now say that this has a 15 meters per second speed. So now you can see that we've reduced 
the, the cross-sectional area and we've increased the speed. So that's one of the properties of air. If you increase, if you cause a restriction, you are going to increase flow after the restriction in, <laughs> in the direction of um, from a high pressure region to a lower pressure region. It, you know, it's pretty obvious what happens. Um, the weirdest thing that happens with this is what happens to the pressure after the restriction. So, what happens is, is if you have a flow running down a pipe and you cause, by whatever means, but you cause the flow to increase speed. Now you can do this, as we've just seen with restrictions, that increases the speed of the flow. Um, and you can add more energy to it, like heat, you can heat a certain section of a pipe, and so on and so forth. But what happens to flow when it speeds up is it loses pressure. So if we imagine we draw our atoms, molecules, like this, at one end of the pipe. Like so. Now like I stated before, these all have a repulsion to each other. They, they all want to push each other away. And obviously they all have motion. But I'll just imagine for a minute that they're static. And then there's a wall here and we remove the wall and they're all repelling each other into this free space. Now this free space could be there are more uh, molecules and atoms per square meter, a cubic meter here than there are there, a higher and pressure uh, regions. It doesn't really matter which way you look at it, if it's either going into a vacuum or it's going from a higher pressure region to a lower pressure region. The um, principle is pretty much the same. So what happens is, is, if we measure the pressure of this, we'll just say again this is 2 bar. If we then um, expose these atoms to this section of the pipe, they will be repelled, or they will expand into this region. But obviously, they don't just move like this, because that's no equilibrium. And these atoms are the ones that have no repulsion from this side, but repulsion from this side. So one after the other, they start to shift as they're repelled, and they start to space out. Like that, like you'd imagine, you know. Um, if you had balls in a tube and you tip them, they'd all start, they'd not all move as one, they'd all start to slowly move one after the other. Now it's not as orderly as that, obviously, like I say, it's all chaotic, but this will do for explaining the principle. Now, our pressure is about um, molecule and um, atomic density within a volume. So if we could just cut this off, theoretically cut this off and measure the pressure, we'd get two bar. But then if we measured it here, and we measured this, we'd get just say 1.5 bar. And then if we could measure this section, we'd get 1 bar. Now obviously if we're moving from a 1 bar scenario, uh, from a 2 bar scenario to a 1 bar scenario, then it would never drop below 1 bar. Um, but as you can see, as these atoms start to pick up and these molecules start to pick up velocity and they're repelled away from each other, it gets thinner as you go. So what you can see is, is that these atoms, just say here, they have a kinetic energy of 10 meters per second. These ones here have a kinetic energy of, um, not 80, a fool. I get that idea from. 15 meters per second. And these ones have a speed of 20 meters per second. So from this, you can see that if you increase the speed of the molecules, the pressure will drop. Now the same is not the other way. If you have uh, molecules trapped inside a container and then you make that container bigger, the pressure will drop, but the speed doesn't necessarily increase of the whole average. They, the speed increases as they move into this lower pressure region, but then as soon as they're uh, as soon as equilibrium, you get a bit, give it a bit of time, then there is no uh, speed increase. Whereas in, if you have a restriction through a pipe and you are constantly um, flowing gases through it, then you will constantly have um, this pressure drop and speed increase at that restriction. 
So what does that mean for our um, diagram of our restriction that we looked at earlier? So not really caring about that there's two bar here and one bar at this side, if we just look at the actual restriction itself, you can see that we have a 2.5 bar here, and now that this flow has sped up, and now that we um, have looked at what happens to flow of air, or what happens to um, a select region of air when you increase its speed um, through a cross-sectional flow, the speed lowers the pressure, so now this is self-feeding. We have higher pressure here, and now this is actually losing pressure, which means it's kind of like um, your egg timer. You know, sand falls away, then there's room for more sand to fall in behind it. So this is what we call suction, which is not suction, like I say. It just means that this is expanding into this region, and because this region is now dropping pressure because speed is increasing, then the um, rate at which this moves from here into this restriction, um, you know, this outlet, in a sense, this exhaust, um, speeds up. So if you add higher pressure at this end, then you're going to get even higher pressure here, but then you're going to have faster velocities, which means the pressure drops quicker here, or drops lower, should I say, and then it's like a self-feeding uh, mechanism. Obviously, you do get to a point where you are... Um, really high pressure here and then you can start having failures and stuff but that really doesn't matter, not for this so uh, I hope all that makes sense about um, this side of restrictions we are going to look at the other side of this so if we reverse this restriction so we go from a small to a large not a large to a small right then, so now we're looking at the reverse of this so we have flow coming down here like so. Doesn't really matter what the pressure is, doesn't really matter what the speed is, but we'll put it anyway. We'll just say that this is the other side of that pipe and we'll say that this is 20 meters per second. And we'll just say that this pressure is two bar. Let's actually put that in. This is two bar now. So, what happens here is as the flow comes out, like I stated in the first video, you have um, this section and this section and these are in a sense in the out of the line of sight if you're a molecule here these are shrouded from view and obviously these start to expand because they're all repelling each other because they don't like each other and when they get here they start to repel each other and try and get away from each other and space out and spread to fill this volume. So, if we take a, re a region here, we've got 20 meters per second and two bar. If we take the same readings here in this section, we'll have a 10 meter per second average speed, and we have a um, originally we have a lower pressure because we've just said we've doubled the volume the air expands into it which means there's more surface area which means the amount of impacts to the surface uh, per surface area drops because there's a lot less molecules that are nicely spaced out so the speed decreases and initially the um, pressure drops even further but what happens over time is, is as all the molecules start to fill this in we're moving along now still in flow a general speed of 10 meters per second. The air behind it that's been fed in is going 20 meters per second. So if this is flowing 10 meters per second still this way, and this is flowing 20 meters per second, well then there isn't, there's a mismatch. This is going faster, twice the speed of the air in here. And again, just like with the reverse, all the air starts to, this is slow moving air, and this air's ramming straight up its arse, it bounces out, bounces out. So basically what you do is eventually you get um, a pressure increase here as well. So all we've done with both examples is if you go from a big cross-sectional area to a small one, um, you are going to get a pressure increase at the um, aperture and you're going to get a speed increase inside the actual pipe. 
uh, the exit, the exhaust. So what you can see with this entire system is that if you go from large cross-sectional area to skinnier cross-sectional area back to large again, we are average normal speed, we'll just call it normal speed, we're speeding it up and then we're slowing it back down again. We call this a nozzle, so this is a nozzle, that's terrible writing, we call this a diffuser, that's the, um, sign, the, the scientific names for them. This is a nozzle because we are converging and this is a diffuser because we are um, diverging. And if you ever see a hairdryer with a diffuser on one of them stupid hoods, I'll put up a picture now. Basically, that's all that's doing is the flow is coming out of the um, hairdryer and then it's expanding into a um, greater cross sectional volume and the air slows down. This is what happens here the air slows down here, so it's going normal speed, it speeds up and then it slows back down in a sense back to normal speed, that's what you can see with this relationship. Um, you can do the same thing the opposite way around, so if we were to take um, and get rid of these titles as well because they'd be wrong, if we were to take this and expand the centre then you would have this scenario where flow coming through at 10 meters ex per second expands into a larger volume which means it slows down and then you would have a uh, restriction here which is these two walls back into our main pipe again the original diameter should I say so if we did that then the roll then we have a roll reversal this is a diffuser and this is a nozzle so basically if you go from big to small, it's a nozzle, you go from small to big, it's a diffuser. And there will be turbulence here, and here, and here, and here. There's always some kind of turbulence, chaotic mixing that happens at these two points, either the nozzle or the diffuser. And if they are stepped like this, quite aggressive, we usually generally call this a restriction. Now restrictions can be both. They can be either opening up into a bigger region, into a bigger cross section, or they can be converging into a smaller um, cross section. So, uh, air flowing through a port into a cylinder, when it actually gets to the cylinder, that is, you're diffusing the air, and that in itself is a restriction because, like I say, the air expands, there's turbulence, and then the air coming in, hitting it slows down so it causes a restriction. Same with a nozzle, if you have a nozzle it means you've got to go from one cross section to another, uh, to a, from a larger to a smaller and again there's a restriction here. Now what you can do is obviously you can smooth this out so you can make it like this and all this does is this covers up these shrouded regions, well actually that's not a shrouded region it's not a shrouded region, but this is a shrouded region, and the flow will flow down, and it's more likely to have less of a turbulent time. <laughs> Can't believe I just said that. But as you can see, this helps with um, removing that restriction. But like I say, get it into your heads that um, restrictions aren't just something in the way. People tend to think, you know, you're putting your thumb over a horse pipe is a restriction. Yes, it's physically restricting the, um, the flow, but there are ways you can do that. You can also use the flow itself against itself to cause a restriction. Hope that all makes sense, and this shape that I've drawn here is a bit of a hint to what we're going to look at next. So the next video is going to be on Venturis and how they work, and uh, yeah, so we're going to start moving away from this theoretical stuff and actually start making it more relevant to engines. Alright, I hope that was clear, and I'll see you in a bit.